Hey, so in this video I want to introduce the um, anterior collection of the one instruments that we retail. Um, I've already done a, a video on the exam kit and sort of introduce a little bit more to the system. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, we um, we sell the, the classic kit of instruments and this really has like a mix of both anterior and posterior instruments so it's a good one to get started with and we did a version of this before it was really popular so we wanted to keep it on sale. Um, but we have grown the instrument collection somewhat and I suppose this reflects how we use them more um, in our own practice is we'll sort of um, pick our kit with, with a bigger selection um, and obviously there's only a limit you can have on the desk so it's better to split it up into anterior and posterior. So the anterior kit has uh, seven instruments that are really useful for, for anterior restorations and if I'm doing an anterior uh, restoration I'll tend to have the exam kit out so I've got my mirror, tweezers, probes and things that you're always going to need and then I'll augment that with an anterior kit. We also have um, a posterior kit which I'll do a video on another time and that's got a really nice selection of, we've added kind of chisels and things which are really helpful um, for, for restoring. So when I'm doing a posterior class 2 or um, any of those I will get this kit out instead. Okay, so um, I'll put those uh, aside for the moment and we'll start walking through the kit. So I thought the best way to, to demo this would be to try and do a couple of anterior exercises and then we can show where the instruments are useful and where they're used. Okay, so let's start with a class 4 cavity and a couple of tips for you. Just one, I'm going to do the bonding procedure, but I want to protect the adjacent teeth from gluing together. So I like to wrap PTFE on the open side where the contact's open and I'm going to use the first instrument we're going to talk about, which is the twist instrument. So the twist instrument is just a very fine, well-made pl flat plastic, but the angle of the flat plastic is slightly off-angled, off and this is particularly helpful for the anterior because the angle makes it much easier for you to work um, with keeping your wrist nice and flat. So once you've got the PTF in place, a little bit of liquid dam and cure that, and that is going to just stop it flopping all over the place when you come to do your etching. So then on the mesial side, we've got a contact point that's intact, and so in these situations I prefer to just use a little bit of the metal strip roll. Um, it's very cheap, very easy to place and it secures itself pretty much so I'll just put that in position. So then for my bonding strategy, um, because we've got a lot of enamel here and typically for anterior teeth I'm definitely going to use a total etch technique and I tend to cover everywhere because um, it's so much easier and difficult to only etch the enamel in these cases I find. Um, so I'm going to cover it all with phosphoric acid just in case the bond or the composite goes over the the rest of the tooth, not just the cavity, and um, leave it for at least 15 seconds. So we can wash that off, which is not so easy to do in the lab, and then um, clean it and dry it, and um, hopefully that PTFE just about stays in place. So now we're ready for the bonding procedure, and the bond I like to use is the G2 Bond by GC. This is quite a new product, and it's the only one on the market that I know of where you've got a true two bottle system but the primer is a universal primer so you can use it in both self etch and total etch technique and this is perfect for me because there's times where I'd rather not etch the dentine um, and there are times where I think it's really difficult to avoid etching the dentine um, and you want that ability to do a total etch technique. So same with all two bond bottle systems you're going to place the primer first never put it in a dappens dish you're going to lose a lot of solvent and effectiveness so straight on the da on the micro brush use multiple micro brushes if you need to and scrub it in for at least 15 seconds and allow the solvent to evaporate now gc actually recommend a direct air source onto this primer um, just to get rid of all the um, solvent and it's because it's a non-hema based solvent it's quite interesting chemical um, and it needs a little bit more encouragement you don't then cure that, you're just going to go straight on to putting the bond on um, and this doesn't need sort of 15 seconds or anything, you just need to apply it. You can air thin if you feel it's pooling but often it's fine um, and then you can cure that. So here we're going to demonstrate the putty index technique. So you've got to imagine this putty was made on a wax up or the pre-op situation before the cavity was cut. So the next thing to do is to mark where we need to add the palatal shell. And the instrument we're going to use to do this is the one that sculpts. So this is one of the most used instruments I have. Uh, one end is a very fine, slightly curved, sharp probe. 
and the other is a thicker probe which is very good for removing liquid and posterior it's quite solid but it's also good for shaping anatomy both posterior and, and anteriorly but there's probably nothing better than this instrument with a little curve for marking the putty just scoring where you want the palatal layer to be added and then we're going to add a enamel layer onto that in part of the tooth using another instrument which is the one that smooths so the goal here is to make a very thin layer of enamel shade composite just where there is a defect and this can allow you to put in your colors and layers we use enamel because that gives us a chance to get some um, translucency on the inside ledge so the one that smooths has got two sides to it you've got a packer side which i'm using now so you can use this in in sort of three different directions so uh, here I'm using it uh, like a flat plastic almost, but you can also sort of pack in a little bit like an optoscope. And the instrument is just designed for big masses of composite to get them in position and not have any um, air inclusions. Here the spatula end is slightly curved and it's like a really perfect shape for um, spreading and adapting composite um, for things like veneers or things like this. The other products I'll use at this point are the GC modelling liquid which can just um, wet that instrument and also the GC brushes. So I like the flat brush, there's a couple of ones available and I like to just put a little bend angle on them. I find them much easier to use, um, especially posterior that way. And then I'll put a little drop of um, modern liquid into a Dappen's dish, um, not too much on there and then you can just smooth and adapt that um, enamel layer of composite a little bit more. We're going to use the brush throughout the layering process. Okay, so now that um, enamel is done and nice and thin, we can then press the putty against the bonded tooth and then simply light cure. So when the putty is removed, you normally have a nice clean shell present on the palatal surface, which is something you can then build against. Now you should have enough space to the adjacent tooth to place a matrix band, but if you've gone a bit too much and you can't, then you can use these um, fantastic metal strips that Tor sell. They all have a little serrations in the middle, so you can use them just to saw through. They come in different grits, both perforated and non-perforated. Okay, at this point you can choose your poison. Um, you could use lots of different types of matrix bands to build the proximal wall. Here I'm showing you the classic sectional matrix band by Torvm, which I think is what most of us used to use until more recently. Um, uh, they're a little bit more awkward to place, but they give you a lovely curve when they're placed vertically. So Torvm more recently, uh, though it's three or four years now, came up with these anterior proximal strips. So on the right I've got the medium and on the left I've got the large. So medium slightly less curved than the large um, and the medium I'll often use on the mesial proximal wall for anteriors where you want it a bit flatter and I'll use the large on the distal. They also have a small which is handy too. Now they come with a little sort of arm on them and you can bend them away like so and that will help secure them. I'm, I like to do that before I place them now. Um, I think you can sometimes get a crimple in them otherwise, but it's very handy just to hold it steady and to, to flex them out um, if you want to just pull them. Very, very easy to uh, place these, much easier than the classics. Um, and then we can place a um, wedge, big space on these type of ones, it's a large one, and that's to overcome the thickness of the band um, so we get a contact point when it's removed. So now we're going to build the proximal wall using um, composite and I like to put a little drop of flowable in first just a, as close a shade as I can get to the restoration but it doesn't really matter it's just a wetting sort of uh, product that's just going to stop us getting air inclusion and then I'm going to place my um, composite ready for the proximal wall. Now to adapt this we're going to use another one of our instruments and that is the one that compacts. So this is a real classic instrument, it's one of the ones I use the most. It's got two pluggers, um, lovely and round, perfect for composite, two different sizes, so it's really versatile for lots of cavities. So here I'm using the smaller end, um, and I'll probably use the larger end in a bit. So we just wanna, I'm just holding that matrix band away slightly with that handle, just to, um, just to make sure that I get as far enough distal as I want, and um, get the cork, curve that I want for this particular tooth um, and then just packing against that and adapting it sort of spreading in all of that flowable that will go through to the palatal side and we can remove that um, and, and getting this really well adapted with no air inclusions and this wall you want to make um, reasonably thin um, and 
but just make sure you make it um, thick enough, um, sort of um, buckle platily. Um, sometimes if I underdo this, then the whole restoration ends up being underfilled. Um, and when I come to polish it, it's no good. It's better if it's too th too wide um, because we can quite easily um, polish it back. So it's important just to remove the excess that comes out platily. And to do this, I'm using that really fine, lovely instrument, the one that sculpts, um, just so I've got a minimum of polishing to do. I'm also using our classic thin flat plastic, the one that is thin. Um, this is basically the same shape as the one that twists, um, except it's a more classic shape, so just um, straight. Um, and so it depends on the situation, which one's better, whether to use... Um, for this wall it's quite handy just having it at 90 degrees, the, the tip, and for cleaving off the inside ledge. So I'm using that here, um, and in other areas it's better to have the little curve on it. So it's just an, a, a classic flat plastic, thin enough to be really delicate and lovely, but not so thin that it snaps all the time. Then I tend to give each increment a quick go over with the um, the brush with a little drop of modelling resin, um, and then curing that. So there's that proximal wall finished. Um, and I didn't talk about the shade for this, so you've got an option of using either a body shade or an enamel shade. Um, I tend to use a body shade in more recent years. It's a bit more forgiving. Um, I think it blends better. I'm sure enamel for the aficionados maybe gives a better result, um, but for me, you've got to get it really thin, otherwise it looks a little bit too translucent. So I prefer to use a body shade. I think it sort of smudges in better and, and, and keeps the shade more predictably good, in my hands anyway. So with the proximal wall, you can take it down if it's a little bit too big, so we can reduce the buckle with the water off um, with a soft flex disc. But just be careful, because you you're need going to polish back at the end anyway, so um, not always needed. What I do more often is I will just thin it out. I find it hard to get these thin enough, so I'll use this little torpedo, long torpedo bow, which is one of my favourites. We sell in the direct bear kits, and I'll just thin it out. So just as long as the water's off, you can just adjust that off, um, and then you need to remove that composite dust um, with a, a, a brush um, that's just dipped in that um, modelling liquid, and brush that off, and you can then carry on with your, bon with your composite procedure. Okay, so we now have a frame to build our shades in. So we're going to add a little drop of flow again, and then we're going to put the dentine shade in, which is going to build the opacity of our restoration so we don't get that shine through from the back of the mouth and it ends up looking, you know, all grey. So we're using the white dentine shade here, and we're going to adapt it with another new instrument. So this is the one that shapes. It's a bit of a new favourite for me. Um, it's kind of these rounded torpedoes that are at different angles on the different ends of the instruments. And it's a little bit like the one that compacts, but it the 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 softness and smoothness of the instrument makes it particularly good um, at adapting and shaping um, composite masses. So um, when we're doing the dentine shade, we're trying to build in a bit of mammalony kind of structure, and also uh, take your dentine shade halfway over the enamel bevel you've put in, and that's going to hide the restoration best. The hardest bit, of course, when you're building your dentine shade is knowing how thick to leave it so you've got enough space for, a sh uh, for the enamel and body shades on top. And that's where we're going to use another new instrument. So this is the one that controls. And the one that controls is trying to control the, the thickness of your top layer, your enamel and body um, that are going to go over um, this dentine layer. So this end here has got a 0.5 millimeter divot dimple on it and you run this along the um, enamel margin of the restoration and that will give you 0.5 millimeter space for your top enamel or body layers. The other end does the same but it's a little longer and you can then torpedo and sort of chase that against the enamel against your dentine shade and to control that thickness that body thickness the dentine thickness that you've got. If you don't do this, you always end up, well, you don't always end up, but you, the risk is that you end up with a restoration that's far too opaque, um, or it doesn't have enough opacity at all, and it ends up being translucent. So getting the thickness of this layer right is critical. So once I've used that one that controls to, to make sure I'm on the right ballpark for, for the thickness of it, I'm then just going to carefully readapt it um, over the um, bevel line, so it's just half over, 
and then I'm not afraid just to break up this mask a little bit um, so we can pull it back from the incisal edge a little bit with the, the one that sculpts just to give it um, a bit more translucency in this region if that matches what the patient has naturally um, and then we can use the other side just to put a little bit of uh, definition, uh, detailing, just to break it up as the light hits it. And I, I don't claim to be a master of doing layering at all. I trying to keep my restorations reasonably simple. I find it more predictable f in my hands. Um, but it, what I do sometimes do is put a little white um, tint just on the incisal edge to try and create a, sort of a halo-like effect. Um, that's about as far as I'll go. And then what I used to do was just put the enamel shade right over the top here, the whole facial surface. Um, but more recently, um, I've been breaking this up into two layers. So I'll use some enamel shade composite just for the um, the tip of the tooth. So the, um, the incisal, probably just less than a third really. Um, so this is an enamel shade um, and I'll adapt that in um, to this area here. Um, so it'll be full contour enamel shade at the tip and then I'll blend that down um, towards the cervical so there's some room for some body to go on top. The reason we do this is the, the body shade just kind of kind of smudges everything. It, it, it's kind of a good midway point and so it gives you a little, it's a bit more forgiving if you haven't got your layers exactly proportioned correctly, which in my hands is a good thing because <laughs> I find that really, really difficult. Um, so you probably don't get quite as high a high um, of, of restoration finish, but um, I find that I get a good enough result more consistently. So here I'm adding the, the last layer, which is the body shade, the white body in this case, and I just want to adapt this as smooth as I can, but make sure I've got enough material that I can get the right primary anatomy. So better to over contour at this point than, than, than too little. Um, it's pretty easy to polish it away if I want to. So just adapting it again with the one that um, smooths, which is very good for large masses. You see, I've been using that quite a lot. And I'll also use the um, fine flat plastics. So it's a combination of the one that's thin and the one that twists, depending on the angle. Also, we'll use the, um, the brush at this point just to adapt and smooth. And you see there a second ago, I just looked down the long axis with the mirror and I'm just desperately making sure that I've got enough bulk of material. So I'm a little bit skiddy in this uh, particular case, so I need to add another mass. So here's the final layer going in, and um, it's just to really bulk out where I've um, under contoured. And um, just show you the, the one that um, smooths is really good. You can sort of brush it up like this, and um, even put a little bit of wetting resin on the tip. And it's um, very good at just sort of smoothing everything out and getting your contour correct. Although you know, there's two ways of doing it here. You can either spend a bit of time getting this right and reduce your finishing, or you can sort of polish back and leave a little bit more to finish. So we've finished the layering um, now, and that feels a good point to leave this video because it's getting quite long. And I'm going to do a second video where I go through the polishing protocol that we did on that restoration to get this final result. So hope you join us for that too, and thanks for watching.